thank you all for coming. Um, hope everyone had a good lunch. Um, we won't make everyone jump up and down to try and keep you awake. But um, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk uh, today a little bit about how we added software updates uh, to the AGL um, Linux. Uh, so um, uh, myself, I'm from a uh, company, uh, ATS Advanced Automatic Systems. So we're, we're, um, we do open source um, connected mobility um, work for, for automotive for the automotive industry. Um, and uh, we did this um, with AGL. Um, so AGL Automotive Grade Linux is uh, be best summarized as uh, open source uh, Linux for cars. Um, and this is a Linux Foundation project. Um, and the members are mostly sort of car companies and, and their supply chain. Uh, and uh, to be clear, it's primarily about building an open source Linux base, um, which, you could, which car companies and their suppliers can then customize and put inside vehicles as they're shipped off a dealer's forecourt, um, rather than a hobbyist thing that you might want to aftermarket stick into your car. Now, uh, there's no real reason why you couldn't do that, but the, um, the kind of the makeup of, of AGL at the moment is primarily focused towards um, building this platform from which other people can then build off. And the idea being this is an open source thing, and then everyone can add their own, um, their own customized uh, top end to it. But by, by sharing the bottom end, um, the, uh, the automotives and their um, suppliers will uh, kind of um, save having to rework all this stuff or, or purchasing something at great expense. Um, I won't talk too much about um, the AGL project itself. Um, I'm not officially part of AGL in any way, so don't take anything I say about it um, as truth. Um, in fact, running parallel with this uh, is a talk by Walt Miner, who is Mr. AGL, and I would recommend if you want to understand more about the company, then, then go and see his talk. But you can't actually go and see it right now because it's, it's running right now. Um, so normally at this point, uh, in, uh, in, soft, in, a, in a talk about software update, I would explain um, why you need uh, software updates and why software updates are important. Um, and I will leave you with just the, this one uh, Heartbeat logo as a reminder. And um, you can imagine that if you were, for example, a car company, uh, you probably are not crazy enough to do cryptograph crypto yourself. And so you probably use a reasonably well-tested um, uh, cryptographic library. And uh, that's all well and good. And you, you say, no, we test all our code. It's all perfect. It's all going to be um, right forever. Um, but then, uh, then you probably have this problem, and maybe now you have a problem of uh, replacing the SSL library on an entire fleet of vehicles in the field. Um, so we all know why they're needed. Um, the, uh, the question which I would like to maybe push a little bit harder is um, why they're needed very early on in the release cycle. So um, you definitely need it by the time you're in production, but there's actually some advantages uh, having it quite early on um, during a product development life, during a product, piece of product development. Um, and this is um, this is kind of the thing. Do you remember when Google did this with the Chrome browser? Um, apparently, pretty much the first piece of uh, Chrome, uh, the Chrome browser that Google built, was the auto updater, and they got everyone to install it. And then once you'd installed it, they just kept pushing updates to it um, uh, through the entire <coughs> development process, so even internally, internally inside Google, before it um, went out as a as a piece of um, code that was shipped to customers. Um, and this is good because you uh, you battle hard on this process, and if the first time you have to do a software update for real is um, when you've already got a fleet in the field, then that's going to be a pretty high stress situation, to say the least. Um, and it's also um, one of the difficulties with testing software updates is an update is always between two versions, right? And so when you've got your final production version, uh, like how do you test the updates? Like what's the next, what's the next that you, um, you try against? Whereas if you've um, had the updates in early, and then all of the kind of, all of the corner cases related to, um, for example, an easy one would be uh, updating database schemas if you're using SQLite or something to source configuration data. As you modify your program, you're going to have to figure out a way of rolling changes forward um, through versions. Now, if you've already done that ten times, by the time your system is um, is released 
uh, out into the world, then the chances that the 11th update is going to work is going to be much higher. Um, whereas if this is like the first time you've ever had to do that, then it may be that you, you increase the risk of running into a situation where something about the database schema means it's very, very hard to update and you find out about this when you've already got thousands of these things everywhere. So it's much better to discover that really early on and then you just kind of you know, tell the 10 people in your office to go blow away their databases and carry on and uh, you get the learning um, when it doesn't really matter so much. Um, there's also another couple of cases, so um, uh, like test fleets, so beta testing um, pieces of software. It's quite nice to be able to do that um, automatically. Uh, we use it internally for our sales demos. So we have some pieces of sales um, uh, demo hardware which are scattered around the world. Um, we're actually based in Berlin, in Berlin, Germany. Uh, but we've got some offices um, ourselves out in uh, Japan and uh, Taipei. And those guys have hardware units, and it's quite nice to be able to push updates to those things remotely rather than having to post them back across the, across the world. Um, and, and finally, um, if you get the development team to use this stuff early on, um, then by the rule of like any developer tool that sucks gets replaced and improved um, by the beauty of dog fooding, um, by the time this thing goes live, it, it absolutely definitely won't suck because no developer will stand for tools that don't work very well. Um, so, um, so that's why you need these updates, why, why it's interesting to put it uh, early on. Um, so the goals for what we're doing as a project, though, um, are maybe a little bit different to a normal, normal system. And so uh, AGL isn't a, isn't a single um, product. Um, that's, it's, a, it's a basis on which you can build um, products. So you, it's a basis on which you might want to build, for example, a, an in-car entertainment system or maps or something. Um, and it's also not a single piece of hardware. Uh, so AGL supports at least uh, half a dozen um, pieces of hardware uh, commonly and, and quite a lot more if you, if you count um, hardware vendors who've ported AGL to their platforms. And so it's actually very wide at both the bottom and the top. Um, so this means that it's not a matter of building a single once-off uh, software update platform. It's a matter of building a thing which can be used for lots of different boards, for lots of different products. And so we kind of had to meet people where they were um, with their existing looks like normal desktop Linux, um, Linux, rather than force some pretty rather than force big changes on on the existing um, stuff that people are doing. And so this um, is sort of another angle on the same thing that. Um, Software updates have been a required feature for any um, shipping embedded Linux product, like since embedded Linux. Um, and lots of people have done it. It's been done dozens, hundreds, and hundreds of times by various people. But these systems all tend to end up as a, um, as a point solution, which is used by like one particular product and maybe reused by the same team the next time they do the next product. Um, but so far, we haven't really seen a uh, a kind of a community develop where you have lots of people each, um, you know, each selfishly building their own thing for their own purposes, um, but contributing those changes back up to some meaningful upstream. Um, and then you get this kind of effect where everyone's doing it for slightly different reasons, but we, between ourselves we managed to build a commons of really valuable code. And I think that's something which, we, which so far the update world hasn't really, hasn't really happened in the software update world. Um, and that's actually quite different from, um, from just making the code open source. Like open source, stick it on GitHub is a, is a requirement, but it's not actually sufficient because it has to be usable by other people for their crazy project, which is nothing like your crazy project. Um, but what we want to do is to find a thing where everyone can build. Okay? Um, so this is, the, this is really about portability. Um, and there's definitely like, if you ever read the Unix is a virus, um, no, okay. Um, <laughs> his basic thesis was that the success of Unix is because it is very, very easy to take it and use it on a on a completely different system that no one ever thought about, and that was why he, that was his claim for why Unix succeeded versus um, various lispy whatever things didn't. But okay, um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, about update methods. So the uh, like 
if you've used desktop Linux, then you've probably used uh, RPM or, uh, or Deb or something like that. And that's, that has the advantage that it's actually very simple to do. Yocto has support for doing this, uh, for generating RPMs built in. Um, but it's maybe not what you want for a, for a product which is going to get shipped out to lots of people. Um, simple is its advantage. Um, first disadvantage is it's unsafe against power off. So if you pull the plug while an update is running with an RPM system, the system will end up in an indeterminate state. Now, caveat, there are some bits of work going on inside Red Hat to make that um, work atomic, um, but it requires uh, support from the file system. Um, and it still doesn't solve the problem of uh, changing between two versions of your system in an atomic fashion. Um, and the other, in, the other issue with RPM is uh, the dependency resolution process by which uh, if you have uh, some application which depends on some library, there will be some combination of application versions and library versions that work together. Now, um, if you've ever run like uh, Unstable or um, Debian, then you'll have certainly experienced uh, the situation where you type uh, app get update, app get upgrade, uh, and you get back this long error message that says, I'm sorry, I can't install this because, and it gives this very long, complicated explanation for the whole bunch of Um, for a whole uh, long and complicated set of reasons why, um, why it can't install this thing. Um, and, the, and the fundamental problem is that um, you can have a set of packages which are mutually compatible over here, and you can have another set of packages over here which are mutually compatible. Uh, but it can be the situation that there's no way of migrating from one to the other while constantly maintaining um, package compatibility. Now, uh, if anyone here is a Durbin developer, then my, uh, my incredible thanks go out to you. Like, this is getting this to work I, uh, is, a, is an incredible task. And they managed to, by the time Debian goes stable, everything does actually seem to work. And I'm super grateful for anyone who, who is in the process of making this work because I understand it's not easy. Um, now, the Haskell guys, uh, in fact, they actually use an automatic theorem prover to try and solve the package dependency upgrade problem. Um, now, <laughs> that, that's, I mean, that is a very clever solution. Um, it, doesn't, it turns out it still doesn't work in all cases because you can always construct uh, pathological cases where it's impossible. Um, and it also means the automated theorem proving may never actually finish. So anyway, um, good for tests, but not uh, great for, um, for a real system. The, uh, another sort of popular solution to this um, uh, is, is to do full file system updates based on a, uh, on a dual bank process. So you take your flash, uh, you basically divide it into two partitions. You have the old, the new, you run, the, uh, you run on one partition, and while you're running on this partition, you update this partition, and then you tell the bootloader to please go and update um, the other partition. And then next time it boots, you, you boot up with this partition and it's all fine. Now. This has the really nice advantage that if the power goes off or you have any problems halfway through, then the system aborts, um, and next time it boots up with the old system and it's unchanged. Um, and you don't tell the bootloader to do the new thing until you've completely finished and flushed all of the changes to the, to the new partition to disk. Uh, and that, means that also gives you advantages where you can do things like um, you can trial boot the new system, and if the boot fails for any reason, then it can automatically uh, switch back to the, old, to the old system. So if you send an update which accidentally bricks maybe some particular variant of a device, then you can automatically recover from that without them either sending the thing back or having some uh, Vulcan death grip to kind of go back into recovery mode. Um, this is good because it's robust. A um, couple of problems with it. So the, the first is it tends to be um, quite device specific uh, in how this update is built because right? it depends on some, some changes inside the bootloader um, and it depends on creating this um, flash partition layout with like a bootloader partition and then one operating system, another operating system, some spare space for users to put their own files on, things like that. Um, and that's kind of a bit in conflict with the requirement of this uh, system to be generally usable by lots of different people. Um, and you also, you still need um, to make some more changes to build this into a, into a sort of fully featured system. So you need some way of incrementally downloading uh, image updates. You don't want to have to send an entire hard disk worth of flash drive 
um, worth of updates every time you update a system. You want to be able to do that um, incrementally. So, I mean, you could use rsync, you could use um, BS diff, um, BS patch to do that would be a solution. Um, but that's still a thing you have to actually build. And then you also need to build the server side infrastructure, which can say, okay, this user has got version number 10 of their system, we're upgrading to version number 12, so we need to, well, either you roll them one or each at a time, or you have to build a difference between version, version 10 and version 12, and then send that diff down. And that's a calculation which you have to do on the server, and you probably have to cache it because it's quite expensive. It's a bit of a pain. Um, but the, the thing we um, selected from AGL, uh, for AGL uh, was this uh, system uh, based on OS tree. Um, now this is this is interesting. This is a, a combination of um, uh, the robustness of this dual system approach, where you have a complete file system image which you've built, which you've tested, which you boot, um, with um, an incremental update, and it looks um, a bit more like um, sort of Git in that respect. And I'll talk about it a bit more on the next slide. Um, this is a more modern approach. Uh, doesn't involve writing. Doesn't involve treating your flash as, a, as an array of bytes because it's not really an array of bytes anyway, um, and has a really nice advantage. It's actually quite easy to make reusable between projects. Uh, so you can. So the work we've done to build to get this to work on these boards is actually quite portable between these boards, and I hope it's quite portable to, to new boards as they come up. Um, so um, OS tree. Um, wasn't developed by me. Um, I mustn't take credit for it. I won't take credit for it. Um, it's uh, so Colin Walters is sort of one of the guys um, behind it, and it's really came out of the GNOME Continuous project. So these were guys doing um, continuous integration builds of the entire GNOME um, project, and they wanted to be able to send these out to devices to testing them. Um, but it's actually found use in a bunch of other places. Um, uh, the Qt company have got a, a system based on it. Uh, their Qt, Qt OTA uh, uses it, and there's a few other projects which are picking it up. Um, and really, the way to think about it is um, is it's like Git, but for um, a root file system rather than a set of source code. Um, so, um, so the way this works is uh, you could sort of imagine it both as taking your uh, your root file system image and then checking the whole thing into Git source control, and then um, uh, checking that out at the far end. And that doesn't actually work in practice um, because Git doesn't have any, um, doesn't have a full set of permissions that you need for a, for a Linux file system. But it's basically the idea you have um, a, a set of files which are hashed and <coughs> stored, indexed by their content, and then it builds up um, directory trees by uh, basically a list of pointers to all of these objects. Um, now this has um, a nice advantage. I'll, I'll describe more about the DOS tree layout in a second. Um, but it has a nice advantage that you only have one flash partition for your entire system. So you don't have this problem uh, with, a, with a dual partition approach where in the factory, when you first manufacture the device, you have to take your flash and you have to chop it up into, into several pieces. And that process where you chop it up, you can never change once that device is left, right? And you have to decide exactly how big your operating system is ever going to be during its entire production life. Um, so you take however it is big now and you make it a bit bigger. And then you have to pay for that overhead twice because you have two copies of this OS partition. And then the bit that's left over is the bit that the user gets to use. So it can be quite expensive. And depending on whether you're um, selling mass market or uh, high value goods will depend on whether that flash is, whether that cost of flash is going to be important to you or not. Um, but you, but the system um, for OS tree works by having one partition and then uh, multiple uh, chir roots inside that. So you have a full, what looks like a full Linux user space down in some subdirectory, another one somewhere else, and the system chooses between those at boot time. Um, so one of the nice advantages of doing it this way um, is in the same way that when you type git pull, it only pulls um, new file objects that or file objects that haven't that are um, new to the system, and it does that in an incremental incremental fashion. And you get the same advantage with this. So if because um, internally on the file system it stores all of the all of every file 
is stored under a file name, which is basically its hash. Um, you can very quickly discover whether or not you have any particular file, even if you've never heard of the name before. Um, and that's used by OS Tree when it downloads these updates so that um, you, you only have to fetch new objects. And there are actually some extended tricks that it can do to get compression between objects as well if you want. Um, uh, unlike um, Git, it also um, uses hard links to share copies of files between, uh, between two different versions of your, of your operating system. So if, for example, you have a very large, um, a large file uh, in, your, in your update which, um, which doesn't change between releases, it might be a piece of uh, configuration data, or in the car industry it might be um, uh, some, some base map information, like you know, outlines, of all of the, um, outlines of all of the countries of the world. Um, that probably doesn't change between, between updates of your system. And if that file is the same on both the old version and the new version, um, what it does is it uses uh, Unix hard links to share that one copy of the file between the two, the old and the new version of your checkout. So this means that rather than being double, it act, rather than requiring twice as much space as a, as a non-updatable system, it requires space um, which is basically the, diff the biggest delta that you're ever going to, ever going to deal with. Um, and so very large files, you can really get some savings there. Yeah. Obviously, if you completely rebuild your system and every file changes, you have to pay it twice. Um, and um, this is, while well, I'm saying it's like Git, it isn't actually Git. Uh, the biggest difference is that Git has a very simplified model for um, permission bits on files. Um, and this is by design. It's designed for, for storing uh, files and source control, it's basically just directory and uh, executable bit. Um, whereas uh, OS Tree has a full set of uh, Unix permissions and also supports all extended attributes. So if you're using SE Linux or Smack, then all of those labels get bundled in um, and it stores those as well. Sure. Yes. It's optional, but one normally. Um, by default, is one. And then, sorry, uh, the question was, um, when you update, when you get a new system update, um, what happens to the old, old one? Um, uh, so does, are these uh, old files kept around? And the answer is it, it cleans them up. So it will um, remove, remove the old um, hard link tree, this sort of cheroot that gets deleted. And it also um, garbage collects objects which are no longer referenced as well. But, but not immediate. Um, it does it. Uh, so when you're, so if you're on version, if you're running version two right now and you're updating to version three, then as part of the update to version three, it will delete files that are uh, no longer needed in one. So that's what I'm wondering about. Let's say that, let's say you have a more complicated case where mm. Mm. Make sure that the system's still okay. And if it's not okay, go back to version two. Yep. Can you do that and have it basically keep version two around for a while, maybe even many days longer, let's say, case type of thing? Mm -hmm. Like with the bad deployment, and now from the server side, you say, hey, I'd actually like to roll that back because there's something we didn't have. Uh, yes. So the, so the question was, if you're at version three and have to go back to two, is that going to work without network? So, yeah, and can you keep that arbitrarily then? Yes. So, yeah. So you can. That's arbitrarily configurable. Um, yeah. Default two. So, if you boot three and it's duff, then two will still be around, but one won't be by default. Two will be, but one won't be yep. by default because the numbers are. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you could choose that number. Make, make that number five, five yeah, if you wanted, yeah. Um, and that might make sense if, uh, I don't know, maybe you, if the network was really expensive, you might want to be able to flick between several versions relatively cheaply as part of some testing process, and then that would make, that would make sense then. Well, sometimes or, you test problems much later. Okay, yes. Um, yep. Something more subtle with the front refreshing four days after. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It also depends on if you host the update function. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
Cool. Oh, good question. Thank you. Um, OK, so this, is, um, this is an overview of what the flash partition looks like um, in, this, in this OS tree world. So this is an example. This is the Raspberry Pi um, example, but others look basically the same. Um, so the, the important thing to distinguish here is um, this, uh, these are partitions and file systems. So there's um, two partitions here, the boot, bootloader partition, and nearly all of the flash is taken up by a single, um, a single partition on the flash. So this could be a one ext4 or f2fs um, file system here. And this is what we call a physical sysroot. And that is distinct from um, like a deployment sysroot or a, a root FS. Um, and this is, a, this, is the, uh, this is the bit which is deployed. So as you're a user space application, uh, this is what you see. And you can have multiple ones of those inside a single, uh, a single, a single physical, um, physical sysroot. Um, and when I was talking about the, the hard link trees, um, so uh, this is an example for two updates, um, both of which have bitwise identical copies of bin bash. And so in that case, um, there's this uh, user bin bash inside version one, and that's a hard link to some object. And there's a user bin bash inside um, this cheroot, and that's also a hard link to this same file system object. And there was also a, a hard link named after the hash, of the, the hash of the contents of the file, and that will be in this objects directory. So if you're, if you're used to Git, then this is your Git objects um, directory. And of course, hard, uh, hard links in, in Unix are, are symmetrical. There's no master of these three. It's just three things all pointing to the same file. Um, and this is actually a little bit different to how Git works. So when you do Git, um, when you do a checkout by default, uh, it actually takes copies of the files because you might want to open that file in Vim and edit it. Um, whereas with OS tree, um, it doesn't want to take a physical copy of it because we're about saving space here and we can trust the system to, to not overwrite these files. In fact, we enforce it. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the layout on, on disk, on flash. Um, and the boot process is. Is the slash OS tree in the root file system as well? Because uh, I was thinking, what if you know you're deploying a root file system that contains slash OS tree? Um, yeah, then you're. Uh, that is that is a problem. Um, the the problematic name is actually slash sysroot, okay. because that's the. That's um, by default bind mounted back right up to this top, so you can have access to it. Um, so yeah, probably don't do that. Would be my best suggestion, um, or it wouldn't be that hard to change it. Although it might be easier to change your code that assumes a file called slash sysroot. Um, okay. Yes. Yes. So in all. Yes. Exactly. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I will, yes, on, <coughs> yeah, maybe it's in the next slide, but, but basically what you do is anything which is inside that, um, uh, anything which is inside here, which is doing this hard link stuff, um, is mounted, there's a read, on, it's mounted over, there's a read only mount over the top of the read write mount for the whole system. Um, so as a user space application, you're unable to change those files. Um, and if, if, you had a, if you changed it in a way that broke hard links, it will be OK. But, but you wouldn't want to assume that. Um, OK, so we talked about the, the file system. Um, and the, I'll now talk a little bit about the, the boot process and how that works. Uh, so uh, basic boot process, uh, the bootloader is the thing which is responsible for picking uh, what's called a deployment. So this is whether it's version two or version three that we're going to run right now. Uh, and that has to be done by the bootloader um, because the kernel may change as part of these updates. Um, and so the, the bootloader is the only thing which can make that decision um, and make sure the right kernel is loaded. Um, so it does that. It boots the kernel. Um, and then there's a, uh, an initRD 
um, or init ramfs, one of the two, um, which is response, which has to be aware of OS tree. Um, so we've got some integration for that. And so that the um, init RD is basically responsible for doing this um, chi root operation. So by default, the root file system is this, this crazy um, physical uh, sysroot. And so it's going to have to uh, do the process of um, chi rooting or pivot root down into some subdirectory and does some bind mounting in order to um, give the system an environment that looks pretty much like a normal standard um, Unix Unix type environment. Um, and then finally, once it's done its thing, it then goes and uh, kicks off uh, your normal SBIN in it. So that's going to be either systemd or sys5 in it. Um, so that's the, that's the actual changes which you need on the final, uh, on the final deployed thing. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the changes we did inside um, Yocto, sorry, Open Embedded for, for integrating this. Um, so there's a new, um, uh, we've added a new image type um, to Open Embedded. Um, and that's, that does some shuffling um, that makes this uh, root file system uh, updatable. So, um, you have to move all of the read-write data um, into var um, because there's a, um, if OS3 has this assumption that any, anything under, inside user is, is part of the updated world and so you may not change anything in there and it will get blown away every time the system updates and anything that you may change um, is inside uh, the slash var. Uh, directory. So we do some, we do, we make that change. We make the um, user move change. Uh, this is a thing which is kind of coming from Red Hat, which is uh, merging slash bin and slash user bin into a single slash user bin. Um, the sim links in place, so as a user, as a consumer of this, you don't have to worry. Um, but it's called user move and it's a thing that's required. Um, and it takes all that and then it um, commits the result. Uh, into a OS tree repo. And this is a bit like a, a git commit on all these files. Um, and that's um, logically the same as uh, either a tarball or an ext3 um, file system image. Um, but in this case, it's a directory of objects that you don't have to worry about the internal format of because OS tree deals with that. Um, but it's just another representation of this um, of a file system tree. Um, and then uh, optionally, we'll update, upload any newly created objects to, um, to an update server. Um, and it does this in a way um, that's incremental. So for example, if you've only changed half a dozen files, it's only going to upload half a dozen objects to the server. Um, and f also finally creates um, an initial, initial um, bootable file system image. Um, so one of the things that's sort of half hidden from you um, without doing software updates is the difference between a, a root file system image, as in slash and anything underneath it, and the actual thing that you have to write to an SD card to produce a working system. Um, now, normally this is relatively simple in its changes, right? It's uh, you've got to figure out where the bootloader goes and there's a partition that wraps it and not much else. Uh, in the OS3 environment, it's a little bit more complicated because um, there's this, uh, you have to do this thing where this is the root FS that comes out of Yocto and then you've got to bundle all, the, all of, um, basically put it under this tree um, and put some objects in here. So it does that. Um, and the integration we've done actually does all of this as part of a normal bit bait process. Um, so these are um, image classes uh, in, in Bitbake, which is really nice. You just type one command and you get this, you get this whole thing done for you. Um, there's a little bit of um, poor board work um, that we also had to do. Um, and this is mostly figuring out how the bootloader is going to work and tweaking some things to do with partitions. Uh, so right now we have um, RenSS Arcar Porter, uh, which is sort of the, almost a standard um, platform that AGL uses as its 
uh, as it's, all, it's almost its reference platform. It has lots of platforms, um, but Arcara is one of the important ones of those. Um, we also support QMU. Um, I mean, in fact, we do that via U-Boot. Uh, so um, by default, QMU has its, effectively its own bootloader. You just pass it a kernel and a root, and it goes. Um, if you're going to pass it the kernel, you can't do software updates. So what we do is we uh, get QMU to run U-Boot as its initial uh, initial thing, and there's like a minus ROM option in QMU that does that. Um, we uh, and then it's pretty standard. Um, Miniboard Max we also support, and we do that via U-Boot. Um, <laughs> it turns out it's easier to uh, to recompile U-Boot for for the Miniboard than it was to try and figure out how to get this stuff working inside UFI. So we, we did the latter. Um, uh, we did the former. Um, we, we support Raspberry Pi 3 as well. Um, and you might get the theme, uh, the process here, but we do that by chain loading via U-Boot. Um, because the Raspberry Pi has its own built-in bootloader, um, but it's actually very, very simple. U-Boot is a supported thing. You just build U-Boot for Raspberry Pi, and then the, uh, the Pi boots, it boots U-Boot, and then from U-Boot, we boot into our stuff. Um, then, so far, we've, we've done everything using U-Boot because it's been kind of the easiest way to get where we want to go. But there's not actually that much in terms of, uh, in terms of code in there. Uh, and so su supporting other bootloaders is, is a relatively straightforward process um, and one I would, I would be interested in having a go, but so far it hasn't been uh, important enough to warrant to not just do the simple thing. Um, the uh, other thing I wanted to, okay, so that's, that's the, the build process and the, and the Yocto um, integration process. So basically getting all of those changes I talked about earlier and getting those inside. And so when you do a normal, um, a normal Yocto developer flow of Bitbake, it, it does all the right things for you. Um, the, one of the big changes um, is uh, in order to support um, updatability, there's a split between, a very hard split between read-only files and read-write files. And so anything which is um, read-only, uh, you know, anything which is updatable, as in you want to be able to push updates to it, has to be in one of these read-only areas because you won't be able to change them. Um, and then anything which is read-write goes in, in var, basically. That's the, the answer for, uh, for OS tree. And so we move slash home into var, so you have like slash homes, slash var, slash home, slash whatever. Go on. <laughs> so the whole file system is read write, yes. Un so basically, you cannot use OS tree, you cannot use this system unless you also do uh, uh, this put, put home in var. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, it's pretty. Uh, yes, yeah, so everything except var and etc is a special case as well. Um, uh, yeah, so etc is an interesting case. Um, so what it actually does for um, for so so the problem is basically this, right? There are some files in etc which users, as in end users, may want to modify, and there are also some files in etc which uh, you, as the provider of this system, may want to modify. Um, and the distinction between the two is actually quite hard to, to make concretely. Uh, so, for example, um, Wi-Fi um, passwords and usernames and passwords are probably on the user side of the thing. Um, but then there are some borderline cases, like, for example, um, you could imagine uh, which particular modems on the system are, are being used might be a thing which is being pushed down from above or might be a thing that you've written some configurator for that the user can change themselves. Um, and like, this is a problem that exists in desktop Linux as well, right? Debian has this like slash etc slash default thing, which is a bit crazy, um, uh, that's trying to separate out bits of the config which the package maintainers are going to work on and bits of the config which 
the end user is likely to change themselves. So what um, OS Tree does is it um, basically it does three-way mergers. So if you can, as a provider, you can make changes to files and they get updated. And if the user hasn't changed, then those updates just get applied straightforwardly. If a user has changed that file, then you get a three-way merge between um, the old and new version from, from you, the provider, and their changes. Now, this is crazy dangerous, right? Um, and probably not the thing you're going to use in production. However, it does work today. And one of the problems with doing read-only root FS is in order to make the system boot at all, you have to go through and find all of these, all of these cases and do some tricks to avoid them. And that might involve patching upstream packages or um, patching the packages to change these things. Um, the the long-term solution for this is the stateless stuff that the systemd guys are doing. And basically what the systemd guys say is um, that, no, um, Packages may not write stuff to slash etc. Um, package configuration belongs in slash user along with the binaries, which makes sense, right? Because configuration that's provided by the package and binaries, by the, and binaries which are provided by the package are fundamentally the same kind of thing, right? Um, and then slash etc should be empty, and then the, the system can change that, and you can store read, things that you modify as a package in slash var, I think. Um, so they're kind of working on this. But right now, it's not quite ready, and you're very quickly going to find packages that don't work. Um, now, the three-way merge on slash etc means that your system will actually work today. Um, and if you, um, you can probably break it if you try really hard. And if it, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a better situation to go from uh, having updates for most of the system with some corner cases where you can break it, and then eventually you have to fix all these problems and delete all the files from etc, than first having to make all of these changes to all the packages, and whilst that process is going on, not actually able to do the software updates in the, uh, at all. So it gives you a, uh, a development level balance, which I think makes sense. Um, but yes, is, is dangerous if you rely on this for, for it. Uh, so if there is an update, I'm sorry we lost our system data, but you know, um, if that's in danger, is that actually worse than a three-way merge? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked deeply into that corner of OS tree. Um, it's, I suspect it wouldn't be that hard to, to enforce that. Or maybe when the three-way merge fails, just abort and blow away slash EDC. Yeah. Um, but I'm outside of my understanding, really. I mean, the right answer is to do the split, right? That's, that's what the right thing to do. Um, so, oh yeah, writable files, uh, all the user data is in var. That's the, that's the key um, change. Um, now, uh, for the AGL application framework, this is interesting. So, um, b background, uh, if you've used, um, Android phones, you've used a very similar thing to the AGL application framework. And the idea here is you can have a split between two sets of developers for a particular platform. You can have um, the people who develop the hardware and the stuff that enables it. And so in the Android case, this is like uh, Motorola who make the phone. Um, and then you can have application developers who develop applications which are portable between multiple, uh, multiple target um, devices. Now, AGL has this support, and it's, um, historically, it was kind of part of the, sort of the, Tizen, the Tizen world. Um, and so what you end up with is, is to actually two software update domains. You have uh, the underlying operating system, the kernel, and all the support things, and you have the, uh, the applications running on, on top of it, as in the uh, app framework managed applications that run on top of it. And they can come from different places. They can be updated on different cycles. Um, now, the, obviously, the user installed applications are in slash var, and they're specifically in varlib uh, AFM on, on AGL. But the question really is, how do you manage, how do you manage that? 
um, that directory. So the, the kind of the simple pure answer would just be to say, well, it's in slash var. Um, it doesn't belong as part of our system. Thank you, goodbye. Uh, and that runs into problems uh, when people want to test. So one of the common uh, use cases you're going to have is, OK, I just want to build this thing, flash it onto a drive, and like, get one of my testers to try it out or something like that. And if they, as part of that process, have to then go and manually download a whole bunch of applications in order to build a usable system, it's not really uh, a usable platform for people to work on. Um, so you could maybe, um, you know, you're probably going to end up in that case writing some script called like install some stuff on my new device. Uh, but now it's a pain, right? You, you sort of build this image in this beautiful bit bait world and then run some random, your own random scripts on the end of it in order to make things usable. And that's not pleasant. So that would be the ignore option. Um, the middle option is, would be to have um, a, com uh, a concept of applications which are installed by the system and applications which are installed by the user. And you could theoretically have a situation where you can have um, upgrades independently on those in these two worlds. Like as a platform provider, I might want to provide some things. And as a user, I can manually install updates. But then there's a real question about exactly what the priority rules between those two look like. Um, and it's also going to be a lot of integration effort, and there's probably some corner cases that are going to be very, very surprising, like what happens if a user upgrades a minor version and then you upgrade a major version, like who takes priority? Um, so what we actually did inside AGL was a little bit simpler, um, and that was to uh, we populate this var application directory um, just once, the first time well, the, when the system is built. We have one population of this, um, this directory, and then after then we don't update it. Uh, and in fact, the reason for that is um, for most of the use cases, this sort of makes, uh, it sort of makes sense, right? So um, when the devices are deployed in the field, um, they're going to get updates for these applications via the application specific update process. That's fine. Um, when you're testing, you're probably either testing the, um, the low level, as in the kernel and board support level stuff, in which case, you probably don't need updates for the user applications, right? The default set from last week, whenever you built the image, is probably going to be fine. So it works for that guy. Uh, and the application developers are probably going to have a situation where um, they have a direct install process straight into a pre-built system, because they often won't be building the image themselves. They'll just be getting a, uh, they'll be getting a binary image from some server that's been built by somebody else. And then using a process like you use on Android, where you type an ADB install to push your updates to it. And so they're, they're satisfied by this solution as well, because um, they don't need to update these things using the OS3 route. Um, so uh, quick getting started, then we're done. Um, so if you want to try this stuff out, it's pretty straightforward. Um, if you get the charming Chinook um, release of AGL, uh, Google search will find it. Um, there's this AGL setup.sh script that basically configures a bunch of layers and um, boards for you. If you just pass in the like AGL SOTA option to that, it will work. Um, and then basically you build and you're done. Um, the code, if you want to look at it, is in um, meta AGL extra um, meta SOTA. Once you've got the AGL code down, it's be easy to find that. Um, and I've included a link there. Um, for the wiki page for the getting started, how to do that. Um, if you're not using AGL but still want to use this, um, then all of the functionality for this um, we've extracted out into a layer called MetaUpData. Um, and this is basically just that code um, repackaged as a thing that you can just pull in anywhere. Um, this should be pretty straightforward to add to any uh, open embedded project. Um, you pull in this layers, you need a couple of support layers. Um, right now, our update client uses Rust, so you need Meta Rust, but that actually that works really well right now. Um, and just to prove that it is easy, we have an example project. So if you go to Garage Quick Start RPI on our GitHub, then um, there's instructions for doing that, and it's basically git clone the repository, run startup, and then bit bake, and you get a, a software updatable image out of the box. Um, I've got one minute, so I will 
say nice use of this is um, you can use it for testing continuous integration builds. So for example, uh, host your build output on an HTTP server um, and then pull updates down um, rather than reflashing entire cards in order to do CI builds. And that's really nice because if you do CI builds, normally you end up uh, destroying SD cards because they don't like huge amounts of writes all of the time. Um, uh, and this is maybe easier than starting switching cards or netbooting. Um, OK, so, so that's me. Uh, AGL is now totally out of the box. And if you're not using AGL, then matter up data and you're done. Uh, I think that's me and that's time. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. I'll hang around after if you, if you want to ask questions. But yeah, um, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>